Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Islam Ibrahim. I lead the morbidity data team at the National Center for Health Information at the Ministry of Health in Kuwait. I'd like to thank the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust for inviting me to speak today about ICD-11. We'll start with an introduction to ICD-11, then I'll show you how to use ICD-11 for reporting a case of carbon monoxide poisoning before we move to our own ICD-11 implementation experience. For carbon monoxide to take its place as a public health issue, doctors need to consider carbon monoxide as a possibility in the emergency department. And for that, they need to be aware of the problem. Once identified, they also need to report it. This includes two steps, documenting the diagnosis, followed by translating that into codes for statistical reporting. Producing evidence-based facts is the best way to raise awareness. And in this presentation, we'll focus on the record part of this cycle. We already have ICD-10, so why do we need a new classification? There are many reasons, but let's start with purpose. ICD-10 was used for classifying the clinician's documented diagnosis into categories for statistical reporting. So although very useful for mortality, which is its original use case, it was deficient in reflecting the level of detail required for morbidity. These details are needed for reporting the complexity of a case, risk adjustment, and a wide range of other applications, such as research, evaluating patient safety and quality, evaluating health system performance, and reimbursement in case of DRGs or case mix systems. Because of its great potential, countries adopted ICD-10, but many had to modify it for their morbidity use cases to meet the needs of their national DRGs or case mix systems, adding the lacking extra details. However, because these details were added individually by different countries, the modifications themselves were not standardized, jeopardizing the comparability of morbidity data. And needless to say, adopting any of these modifications is not free. In 1994, when ICD-10 was released, and when George Clooney played a pediatrician on ER, his medical records looked like this. But if he were to play on ER now, this is how his medical records would look. ICD-10 was developed in and for another era. We now need an electronic classification developed for today's digital world. You may be thinking, I'm a clinician, ICD is not for me. Perhaps that was the case with ICD-10, but with ICD-11, we may have to reconsider. Because with all the previous versions of ICD, the main target was to increase the capacity to accommodate the growing number of diagnoses in health conditions. But ICD-11 is a completely different concept, as we'll see in this presentation. Now let's zoom into the health provider perspective. Documenting the patient's diagnosis is an integral part of our medical practice. We all know and approve of that, but what bothers us is the tiresome way we're required to follow to accomplish that goal. Many times, in addition to free texting the diagnosis, we're asked to use drop-down menus that most probably do not accurately reflect what we're trying to say. Or, due to heavy workloads, doctors have no time to go through long lists of similar-looking titles and are forced to just click any option on the list to get the step done. In other settings, a coder is there to translate what we documented into codes. The problem is sometimes part of our documentation is lost in translation. Plus, it's an unlean process with potential non-value added steps of back and forth queries and responses between doctors and coders. What ICD-11 does is that it standardizes the way we document diagnoses. The ICD codes are important, of course, but from the user perspective, they are just byproducts that are saved in the back end once you document the diagnosis, with nothing lost in translation. Shortage of professional coders means their time would be better spent auditing our codes and making sure that our morbidity coding guidelines and DRG system requirements are fulfilled. But to be able to have clinicians do that, we need a tool that is user-friendly, clinically up-to-date, and speaks our language as clinicians, not informaticians. We all use Google. It's a user-friendly search engine that anyone can use successfully within a few minutes with almost no training. But that's only possible because of the huge work behind it. 
ICD-11 works in pretty much a similar way. It works through an electronic coding tool that functions as a flexible search engine. Developed and maintained by the WHO, can be embedded in any electronic medical record or health information system, it's free, it works online or locally offline, and uses natural language processing, which means you can type in your diagnosis just like you would if you were free texting. So let's see how it works. We simply type the diagnosis. The tool starts guessing the word as we type, producing a set of search results. We look them up and click the one we want, and we're done. You don't need to worry about the codes or code structure. They are automatically saved into the database. What happens behind the scenes is this search engine searches through the foundation, which is a huge database of diagnoses, health conditions, and medical terms developed by many teams of clinical specialists. So ICD-11 was made by clinicians for clinicians. Because it was developed by clinicians, it's realistic. We can freely search using many of the synonyms and terms used in actual practice. For example, there are so many ways we can document type 2 diabetes. This is one of the most commonly documented diagnoses on Earth. We don't even need to use capital letters. And in each case, you end up saving the same code and entity title in the hospital database. Doctors love abbreviations. They make our life easier. But they were a big no in documenting final diagnoses because different specialties use the same abbreviations to refer to different conditions, confusing coders, and the coding tool can help us resolve this problem. So, for example, in one hospital, one doctor may document PE to mean preeclampsia. Another may use PE to mean pleural effusion. And a third may use it to mean pulmonary embolism. Every one of them would type the same thing into the coding tool. Yet, every one of them would still be able to record the correct diagnosis into the electronic medical record database by simply clicking the correct entity. ICD-11 content is updated annually, so its content is always clinically up to date. And there is a transparent proposal mechanism in place that enables users and experts from all over the world to suggest changes to improve ICD-11 content, provided, of course, they give a rationale and references for their proposals. You can also see and comment on other users' proposals and see the reply of the WHO team. This is one example relating to carbon monoxide poisoning. The Carbon Monoxide Research Trust has shown interest in the potential ICD-11 can bring into reporting cases of carbon monoxide poisoning, and it has held a series of roundtable discussions on the topic. Let's introduce one of ICD-11's important new features that was discussed in those roundtables. Extension codes. ICD-11 is able to capture the granularity of our clinical documentation through its use of extension codes. These are a sort of add-ons that we can choose to attach to our diagnoses. We can add laterality, anatomy, course, infectious agents, and many other aspects, even more than the ones we see on the screen. For example, if we are reporting a case of DVT or deep vein thrombosis, we can simply click here and we're done, or we can choose to add more detail to this diagnosis. A window opens up for us to view the details of this entity. And under post-coordination, ICD-11 offers us add-ons that are relevant to our diagnosis. In other words, the diagnosis-specific add-ons. For example, under laterality, we can simply click right to add it to our diagnosis. We can also add the specific vein affected, either by using a drop-down menu or simply typing into the search box, which guesses the word as you type. Simply click to add it. We end up with a cluster or string of codes that are automatically saved into the hospital database. We don't need to worry about the codes or code structure. All we as users care about is that the diagnosis includes all the important details we want, and we can clearly read them highlighted here in yellow. 
So are extension codes a help or a hindrance? Well, as a rule, the level of detail in our clinical documentation is always based on the data use case or health system documentation guidelines or requirements. For example, for a case of breast cancer, a cancer registry would include histopathology, staging, grading, and so on. But perhaps if the same patient visited the emergency department for an emergency related to her condition, an emergency department doctor would neither have the time nor be interested in this level of detail when documenting her diagnosis. So extension codes are mostly optional. It's like walking into a supermarket and finding all sorts of goods. The fact that I don't eat spicy food doesn't mean that the supermarket should not have them for on their shelves for other customers to pick if they so choose. Now we'll see an example of reporting carbon monoxide poisoning in ICD-11. We'll use the story that I found in the news where a group of people in a restaurant with closed windows and doors suffered carbon monoxide poisoning during a dinner where a hot pot was kept on fire lit by charcoal. Suppose we're reporting the case for one of the cooks. So on the ICD-11 coding tool, we type in carbon monoxide poisoning and it's right there under harmful effects of or exposure to noxious substances, chiefly non-medicinal. Now, this is a very general term, but under that, highlighted in blue, we can see carbon monoxide poisoning. Let's click details to see what happens. Now, NE61, and um, as we said before, we don't need to worry about these codes, is the category under which our diagnosis is categorized. And although this title doesn't seem to be specific to carbon monoxide, in fact, it refers to the effects of many other noxious substances, the tool provides us with only the index terms under that entity that match our search terms. To make sure none of our documentation is lost, we'll click the plus opposite the term that best matches our diagnosis, acute carbon monoxide poisoning. Now we see that although the code for um, the, the, the condition is the general code, NE61, yet the specific term we selected and a unique identifier for that selected term will also be saved into the database to ensure that none of our documentation is lost. And that's done automatically by the coding tool. So as users, none of this matters to us. All that matters is that we can clearly see that the selected term is what makes sense to us, acute carbon monoxide poisoning. Now let's scroll down to post-coordination to add the circumstances of this poisoning. Under associated with, we can see four options to choose from. Unintentional exposure, in other words, accidental. Intentional self-harm, assault, or undetermined intent. We know it was accidental, so we'll click this option. And it's added to the cluster. Now, ICD-11 offers us the chance to add more detail to unintentional exposure to harmful effects of carbon monoxide if we wish. We may skip this step if it's not required in our situation, or we can further specify the source of carbon monoxide, we may report the activity of the patient when injured, or the place of occurrence. Now, at this stage, different users will have different requirements based on their use case. Researchers, clinicians, paramedics using, um, you know, reporting this on their portable devices, firefighters, poison centers, and many other potential users will each pick and choose what optional details they see as relevant from their point of view or based on their documentation guidelines. So it's optional and it's based on the different use cases. Here I chose to add carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion of charcoal, paid work because we're coding for the cook, and nightclub, restaurant, or other commercial place for socializing and so on as the place of occurrence. One great feature in ICD-11 is that we can even specify not just the type of place where the event occurred, but also the exact part of that place, something we were unable to do in ICD-10. So we can, for example, say garage at home or bathroom in nursing home and so on. So with a few clicks, we are able to tell a whole story. Now to our case study. 
So ICD-11 is successfully implemented for documenting final diagnoses by physicians in the outpatient department and inpatient wards in the largest public hospital in Kuwait by installing the coding tool on the hospital information system. And this has been the routine way for documenting diagnoses since December 2021. The coding tool is embedded into the electronic medical record system in the hospital. Doctors use it to type the diagnosis and as we can see, they can also use abbreviations. They look up the set of results, click the one they want, and on the user interface, they see only the entity title, not the code because that's what's meaningful to doctors. However, at the same moment in the database, the ICD-11 code and the unique identifier for the diagnosis the doctor documented are automatically saved into the hospital database. Well, it took us almost a year to reach full hospital implementation. We started with stakeholder engagement. Then we planned our pilots so, so that it's um, on a manageable scale. Then um, we trained the doctors in the department where the pilot will take place. Then we conducted the pilot over a period of four months. And based on the data we collected and the lessons we learned, we planned our full implementation. This was followed by training on a large scale and finally full hospital implementation. Implementing ICD-11 has four main stakeholders, health information managers, hospital administration, IT staff, and of course the main users in our case, physicians. Changing the ICD coding process from drop-down menus and medical coders using ICD-10 to physicians using ICD-11 is an organizational change and it requires effective communication. So we tailored um, stakeholder specific messages to persuade each one of these stakeholders to buy into and commit to this change. And to do that, we were answering one key question from each stakeholder perspective. What's in it for me? Our main message to physicians, for example, was that ICD-11 is user-friendly, like Google, very practical and realistic, and it's rich in synonyms and abbreviations. It standardizes and improves your diagnosis documentation, and its content was developed with the contribution of expert clinicians. During the pilot, we were keen to listen to their opinion. Um, so we used a very brief user experience survey to ask three simple questions. Did you find what you're looking for? How easy was it? And the time it took you. And based on their positive response, we were able to go ahead with full implementation. We also benefited from the proposal mechanism offered by the WHO to add the synonyms and abbreviations that the doctors looked for but couldn't find um, add, uh, in their daily practice on the coding tool. And I'm happy to say that all our proposals have been implemented and are now part of ICD-11. One of our main success factors was having a multidisciplinary team approach, and we involved representatives of all stakeholders. And I, I want to underline the involvement of physicians from day one, because when users are involved in the decision-making process, they are more likely to accept and adopt the change. And this is what happened in our case. Uh, training. Well, training was a bit challenging because physicians are busy and they are not interested in non-clinical tasks like documentation. So we provided different options to access the training. Either um, uh, physicians were able to attend in person or they got to watch two different videos on ICD-11 and on documentation of uh, final diagnoses. This was of short duration. So the in-person training lasted around two hours, including the practical computer lab exercise. And if they watch videos, it was um, two 10 minute videos plus a 20 minute hands-on exercise using virtual simulation. And I'll come to virtual simulation in a minute. We also used screenshots from their own hospital electronic medical record system for familiarity. That was really, that was a good option because it helped physicians focus on the changes made on their own medical record system, not on ICD-11 itself. And this helped reduce potential resistance to change and kept training relevant from their own point of view. Because ICD-11 is completely electronic, we were able to use social media to widely disseminate our training material. WhatsApp groups used by different departments were our main medium for uh, disseminating the videos. And later we created a YouTube channel and we uploaded our videos there. 
We also had to include hands-on exercise uh, to make sure that um, uh, to make sure that uh, the coding tool uh, doctors were able to use the coding tool in practice. And we used a virtual simulation, which is actually less fancy um, than it sounds, but it made our life much easier because there are more than 1,200 doctors in the hospital and training them in the conventional ways is unfeasible and almost impossible. Would have taken much, much longer time than uh, we, actually, um, we actually had. So um, basically, it's a virtual ward in the hospital information system with an imaginary case. Each doctor accesses that case using their username and password, just like they would access a normal case. There they find a list of diagnoses that they need to use the ICD-11 coding tool to record. And they, they can do that at their convenience whenever they have the time. So on, then they can also do it on any computer terminal in the hospital. And as they sit in front of the computer, they scan a QR code using their mobile phones to access a sort of cheat sheet or walkthrough sheet. And then this cheat sheet guides them through an exercise that takes them step by step through this um, training, uh, just like they would have done if they had a trainer in the room. Um, and th this cheat sheet used screenshots from the hospital information system and, you and was done in very, very simple steps. We also provided on-site support during the pilot and at the beginning of full hospital implementation. So there was two types of support. Um, there was um, ICD-11 support and clinical documentation by our team from the National Center for Health Information and IT support from the hospital IT team. And we did that through daily rounds on all the computer workstations and also we left our phone numbers. Uh, they were available for around the clock support. The main challenge we faced was having physicians as ICD-11 users. So physicians are only interested in using ICD-11 as a means for standardizing diagnosing documentation to replace the free text and the tiresome drop-down menus. They were they like the abbreviations, they like being able to use different synonyms, and they, they like that part. But they are definitely not interested in applying the guidelines for morbidity coding and reporting, which would be of paramount importance if a country is using a case mix or a DRG system. So in countries that do use case mix systems, they will still need to have experienced coders. But the good news is less of these coders or less of their time is going to be uh, wasted on the mere transformation of text diagnoses from text to codes. And this would allow these coders to use their time in a much better way and use their skills and efforts on working on much more needed tasks like improving quality of clinical documentation, or auditing medical records, and so on. Now, I want to share with you some useful resources. So you can scan this code to reach the ICD-11 browser, and you can access the coding tool here. It's free, you can try it online, and it can be easily installed by any IT team in your facility using an API. This is our YouTube channel for um, the channel for the National Center for Health Information. And um, our center also serves as the WHO family of international classifications collaborating center in the Eastern Mediterranean. You can find education material here on ICD-11. Some are specifically tailored for clinicians, and, uh, but others are more detailed and everybody can, uh, can watch. Um, you can also see doctors from the hospital speak about their own experience using ICD-11. And if you'd like to contribute to ICD-11 content, you can also watch a video about a proposal submission. This is the paper we published about our pilot, detailing the methodology in the lessons learned. And for those of you who are in the process of planning their implementation, this is a useful resource. This is the WHO ICD-11 Implementation and Transition Guide. Thank you.